I'm excited, very thrilled to welcome Regine. She is the Civics Inclusion Manager for the Women's Fund of the Greatest Greater Cincinnati Foundation. Um, she was born in India, but she lived in the U.S. for 30 years, and she worked for 10 years at Duke Energy as the Director of Strategic Planning uh, and Business Operations. And a few years ago, she decided to switch gears and she joined the Free Store Food Bank here in Cincinnati as the Advocacy and Community Relations Officer. And then prior to joining the Women's Fund here in Cincinnati, she worked for the United States Senate. Definitely want to hear more about that. Um, she has a BS in education from the University of Utah and an MBA in finance and management information systems from the University of Kentucky. And is graduate uh, certificate in marketing strategy from Cornell University. She lives here in Anderson Township, which is right by downtown Cincinnati, she, with her husband, her son, and her fierce black cat. Uh, so, Regine, thank you so much for coming on and talking to us. And anything else you want to share about your background? Anything we need to know? And what did you do for the U.S. Senate? Ah, good question. Good evening, everyone. How are you all doing? Um, we will make this very interactive. I'm going to leave some time at the very end so that uh, we can field some questions. Um, I used to work for the United States Senate about 10 months ago. I served as a staffer for Senator Sherrod Brown. Um, the first time I interacted with Red Wine and Blue, um, coincidentally, was when I was working for the Senate and Connie Schultz um, was your guest. So um, I knew as a staffer for the Senator that uh, she was coming on. And that was the first time I actually logged on and registered at Red, Wine and Blue. And ever since I've been a fan. So I'm really pleased and honored to be here. Um, just uh, eager to hear from all of you and uh, share a little bit about the work that I do currently at the Women's Fund. So I do have a presentation. I don't know if I should go ahead and get started. What do you think, Julie? Yeah, just give them, a, give them a little bit of background. I am just curious. I, I, uh, we met at an event, um, and she, <laughs> Regine, handed me the card for the group that was called Appointed, and I was like, "What is this all about?" <laughs> so maybe you could just share a little background on how that all got started, and then yeah. we'll kick you over to the present. Or if your presentation covers that, we can kick it over to that now. It does, but I can, I can just to give you a little bit of background. Um, so I stopped working for the senator in June of last year and transitioned to the Greater Cincinnati Foundation. I work for the Women's Fund, which is a affiliate of the Greater Cincinnati Foundation. And um, what we do at the Women's Fund is we do, it's we are primarily like a think tank. We are a think tank that is based here in Cincinnati. And we do three things. We do research, um, we do a lot of advocacy, and we do a lot of civic engagement. So those are the three pillars on which we are grounded. Um, everything that we do is based on research, on data, on studying what is out there, what's going on, the latest in the field. Um, then we um, try to advocate for it by working with uh, elected officials um, and the government to make systemic change. So we try to make change where it matters, find the root cause for um, an issue, and then try to very slowly um, change that. It takes time, it takes perseverance, it takes a lot of just dogged determination, nothing else. And then uh, we also um, try to empower women. So the work of the Women's Fund is very much focused on women, especially women's economic mobility and women's civic engagement. So we try our, um, our big focus is to try and uh, make sure that women are prepared and empowered to play an active role in government. And I can't think of a more opportune moment in history when uh, this is uh, become uh, important as it is now um, with so many things going on in the world and um, uh, women's um, empowerment being at the center and the core of most of these issues that are played today, um, I think um, it is more important than ever that women learn how to um, get involved um, and make their voices heard and find a seat at the table. So that's what my work is focused on. I run a program called Appointed. Um, that is uh, basically the, it's, it's a, um, it's a program that empowers and prepares women to serve in um, local government. And I will go into the details of it as we move along with my presentation. And then you'll hear a little bit more about why we started this program and why it's important to get involved. Pointed is a program that I manage and it uh, 
prepares and empowers women to serve on civic boards and commissions. And I'm gonna explain that in a minute. So it's a nonpartisan initiative. Okay, so we are nonpartisan. That means that this is open to both parties, neither Republican nor Democrat. And what it does is it inspires women and it prepares women and encourages women to get involved in local government. And what does getting involvement involved mean? It means serving. It could be different things, right? So the first thing, first option is to apply and to serve on a civic board or commission. And we're going to talk about that in detail. Um, the other option is to serve on a county, city, or a local township board or council. Um, by that, I mean um, a civic board can be um, in different spots. It could either be at the county level, it could be at a city level, it could be at a local township level. So you could serve anywhere and you could still be involved. Um, you can run for office. The most obvious um, option is that we have several people who join our program with that one specific um, goal, which is to run for office. Um, you could run for school board. Again, that is something that you have to actually run for. It's a, it's a political campaign and uh, you can do that. You can get you can get involved in a local nonprofit. Nonprofits do wonderful work, and they um, their boards and their um, their goals are very much in you know in tune with systemic change. They try to do a lot of valuable work in the community. So if none of these other things open up, or they you don't have the time to do that, you can always get involved in a local nonprofit. So what are civic boards and commissions? It's not something you hear a whole lot of. You hear about uh, nonprofit boards quite a bit, but you don't hear that much about civic boards and commissions. What are they? I'm sure you've heard of these terms like planning commission, the zoning commission, the board of adjustments, the ethics commission, the airport board. These are some of the boards that we have locally here in Ohio, especially in the greater Cincinnati area, but I, I think you can find them anywhere in the country. So um, there are human rights commissions, the park advisory committee, the mental health and recovery services. So they basically cover the entire gamut. You'll see them, you'll hear about them all kinds of places. Um, and you probably never think twice about them, but these are places where you can actually serve and get involved in local government. So that's what we're gonna talk about. There's someone wanting to get in, so I'm gonna admit them. Okay. Don't worry, we got all the admissions, don't worry about it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, Okay, so when we started our work, as I said before, our work is grounded on research. So we gathered a lot of data. We didn't want to just go out and do this and start this program without really understanding what was going on and if there was a need for something like this. And this idea actually came to us from the um, Greater Kansas City uh, Women's Foundation. There is another organization um, in Kansas City, believe it or not, that does something similar. We heard about them and we said, well, this sounds like a cool idea. Let's look more into it. And we started doing the research in the greater Cincinnati area. And by the greater Cincinnati area, I mean um, four counties in Ohio, three counties in Kentucky, and one Kentucky, one, one county in Indiana. So we started gathering data on how many boards and commissions were actually existent in this area. We found, we gathered data on what the current composition of those boards was. So how many men, how many women, how many different kinds of boards, and then what is the composition of each board or um, commission? So um, what is the gender um, makeup of each one of them? So how many men, how many women, and what is the ratio, what does the gender ratio look like? And this is what we found. We found that um, overall, in this area, and I did not put this on the slide, the makeup was about, I would say less than a third of the boards and commissions at this uh, point are um, occupied by women. Most of the board positions, the commission positions are filled by men. It's almost a 70% to 30% breakdown. So it's 30% women, 70% men. I would say there's more than 30% of uh, boards that are actually um, fully occupied only by men. So they are basically um, male dominated boards that you find um, the majority of in some areas. The need for gender diversity on civic boards and commissions varies on by region and state. So basically um, it's not the same across the nation. So I don't want um, anyone thinking that this is how it is in New York City or this is how it is in Pennsylvania, we don't know. Um, but we know that since we are here in the greater Cincinnati area, we know that it's about 70, 30 um, in this area. 
And if you go to more progressive parts of the nation, you probably will find it a little bit more favorable to women. Um, at the same time, if you go to more conservative parts of the country, you probably will find it more male dominated. And I just I, I say that just because if I just consider Ohio versus Kentucky versus Indiana, that is the that that's what I'm finding is that there, it is as you go to more conservative neighborhoods, as you go to more conservative areas of the region, you'll find it to be more male dominated. And that's not anything against them. It's just a systemic thing. That's how it's been. It's just a product of what has been going on. Um, it's something that we have to work on. Um, there may be an underrepresentation of women's appointments on, I can't see this because I have to move this somehow. Okay, on power boards, yes. So um, basically there are certain boards and you have to really know about boards to know this, but there are certain boards that wield a lot of power either because they get to make some really important decisions um, economic decisions or they have more money than other places they 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 make they they for whatever reason they have more clout than other boards one of them for instance is the um planning commission um historically i've uh, we have we have found that um planning commissions are somehow perceived to be more powerful um, there are a few like that, like, for instance, the Port Authority here in Cincinnati is considered a very powerful board. It's very difficult to get on them, um, get on that board. So those powerful boards are concentrated, men concentrate, men are concentrated on those power boards. And uh, the, the term power boards is not something I came up with. It's something that is um, used quite a bit in this, um, in this field. It's basically a board that is highly sought after. And there are a few boards like that. And unfortunately, women are underrepresented on those boards right now. Um, the other is, um, there's always, um, some sort of gender sorting that goes out. And this is something that we found when we did our research is that if there are boards that have feminine missions, and by feminine missions, I mean um, uh, health and human services or arts and humanities, those boards tend to be more uh, dominated by women. Women are more easily appointed to those boards. We don't have to fight as hard to get on those boards with feminine missions. But then if you go to boards that are more male oriented with masculine missions, for example, zoning or planning um, or uh, tax um, or um, transportation, then it becomes even more difficult for women to get appointed to those boards. And so uh, there's, there seems to be a bias there as well. And we, and we have to be aware of that. So if you if you try to apply to a board that is male dominated um, with a masculine mission, it might be harder for you to get on. So what does that tell you? It tells you that we need greater transparency of appointments, vacancies, and the application process. And um, that is something you will find as you start looking into this and whether you can apply, that in many places, the number of appointments is pretty, um, it's hidden, it's not, it's not open. Um, there is very little transparency there. Um, also, we, you know, they don't like to usually share how many vacancies are there, how many, um, you know, and how the pro how do people get a, um, get appointed? What is the application process? Where do you find the application? Those things are sort of left out of uh, the public domain, and you have to kind of dig around and ask a lot of questions um, before you can get those answers. And that also, this is not nationwide. I want to I want to caution um, everyone who is um, listening that this this is something we have found uh, very specific to certain areas of the of the nation. So if you live in a more progressive um, part of the country, you probably will not run into as many obstacles as you would if you were living in a more conservative area. I just wanted to say that. So what does appointed um, recommend? We recommend that civic leadership should reflect the communities that they serve. So basically, um, you know, as, as we all know, the communities um, that we serve, that they serve, that the government serves is not uh, homogenous. It is not always all white. There is a lot of diversity and we feel that leadership should reflect that. And what are the benefits of that? If you have a diverse board, if you have a diverse commission, um, um, you, have, you have diversity in um, government, it leads to better group dynamics. It leads to enhanced governance. And these are 
results that have been proven. This is based on research. You find that people make better decisions um, when um, there's more diversity on a um, elected board or commission. Um, there's um, better financial performance. We find that um, when, when there are corporate boards and corporate boards have more diversity, then those companies usually show better financial performance. And overall, it leads to improved reputation. So if you have, if you are chairing a board or a commission and you feel, and you see a lot of diversity on um, that board, then, um, you know, you end up um, getting having a better reputation than if you had a completely all white um, uh, representation on your board or commission. So we advocate for uh, more diversity, um, more women to be um, appointed to boards and commissions because of that. And interestingly enough, um, if you ask, if you do a survey and say, why uh, were why have you not applied um, to a board or commission? Most women will tell you it's because I was never invited to, or I was never asked to. You know, they never take um, the very few, I, can, I shouldn't say never, but it's very, very seldom that they take the initiative and say, oh, I'm gonna apply to a board or commission because many times they feel they are not qualified. They don't have the confidence. They feel that um, they will not be able to um, do what it takes to serve on a board or commission. So what is my message to you? Consider yourself asked now join the movement. So don't wait for someone to say, oh, would you like to join this border commission? It may never happen. It is on us to take the initiative to find boards and commissions and apply. So what does that mean? What are the next steps? First thing I would encourage is to do some self-examination reflection. Think about what skills you bring to the table. Okay, so uh, and it doesn't mean that you have to be a professional who works either as a, an attorney or as a um, executive in a corporation or a physician or any of those things. You could just be a mom who raises children who go to a certain school district. You might be interested in what's happening in that school district. Um, you may know a lot about it because you have put two, two, two kids through school there. That's all that it takes sometimes to be on an education commission or a board somewhere. Um, you may be a resident in a community where um, you know you have you've lived for thirty years and you've seen a whole lot of construction and all kinds of bad decisions made on buildings here, there, everywhere. And you have an opinion that you really want to share. It doesn't mean that you have to be an engineer. All you need to do is go in and say, "Look, I'm really interested. I've lived here. I've seen all these things happen, and I really would like to." you know, be appointed. Um, so don't ever underestimate the skills that you bring to the table. Um, you, you know, think about what all you know. What do you know about the community? What do you know about yourself? What do you know about raising children? What do you know about um, living in a certain place? And also think about what your passions are or what are you passionate about? You know, have you looked at a change that has happened in your community recently and felt like, oh, I wish I had been able to speak about this to someone. You know, you've driven by some place where they're building a shopping mall and you've, you know, it's in your community and you felt, I wonder who made the decision to put that thing there. It's a real eyesore. And I wish I had been able to speak to someone about it. Or someone makes a decision in your child's school and you're thinking, you know, why did they decide to do this? And why did they decide to teach this versus something else? Again, you wish you'd been, you had a chance to make your opinion heard. Um, those are the places where you, you, you could concentrate. So first thing you do is identify your skills and identify your passions. And then go to the county, town, or city. You don't have to do one of the three. You can do all of them. Or the village where you live. Go to the website and explore it see where they have listed the boards and commissions. You may have to dig a little bit. Sometimes, very often, they are under the government tab. Um, you have to go in there and do a bunch of like clicking on the, on, the, on the drop downs, look at all the menus, you will find it. Or you do a search and you'll find civic boards and commissions listed. Look at those boards and commissions and usually there will be a description under each board and commission that describes what it does. Um, and then look for a list of vacancies. Sometimes, more often than not, you will not be able to find vacancies listed depending on where you are. I have, you know, we have eight counties that we um, 
work with here at the Women's Fund. And there are maybe two or three counties where these are listed, the rest are not. You will have to, if they're not listed, you'll have to call or email to try to get information. And then you have to apply, apply, apply. And you will have to check back to see if there are more vacancies and more openings and you will have to do that over and over. Be patient, but relentless. Um, we are working on systemic change. The reason I say that is because this is not something that is built in your favor as a woman. Uh, this is something that you're going to have to fight for. I say this up front every time I do a talk because I feel like women go in thinking, first of all, that they should be asked. And then if they're not asked, then they feel like once they apply, they should be at least heard or given an interview. It doesn't always work that way. I've heard from so many people who have said, I have applied and applied, no one's replied. Why should I continue to do it? You need to continue to do it only because we are working on changing the system. And changing the system is urgent in many cases because things are happening and we are not even aware of certain decisions that are being made, some changes that, that are being made. And many people would prefer to keep it that way and keep you out of it and keep your voice out of it. And we have to continue to fight to get a seat at the table. So my biggest advice to people who, to all of you, is to start doing this and then continue to apply, continue to follow up, call, um, ask where the application is, who's looked at it, when is the next uh, vacancy coming up? When can you hear back? When can you expect to hear back? Can, can I come in for an interview? Can I meet with the person who is appointing? Like, you know, is it a uh, commissioner? Is it um, the, the chair of the commission? Can I speak with him? Can I meet with him? There's nothing wrong with asking. The worst thing they can, the, the worst they can do is to say no, and that's fine. You know, be prepared for that, but then keep asking. Um, yeah, and then um, one of the things I was going to say, if you are in the Cincinnati region, um, feel free to join Appointed because we do help um, you with the application process and um, in, in following up and stuff like that. Um, I think that's all I had to say at, on this slide, but um, we'll come back if you have questions, we can always answer later. So what does this program that I manage offer? Um, we, if you join appointed, you get on our mailing list um, and you stay informed about vacancies and boards and commissions in this region. So if you are not in this region, then this will not apply to you. But if you are in the greatest Cincinnati region, then if you if you join appointed, then you will get on a mailing list and we will inform you about vacancies as they come up. If we hear about it, there are certain boards and commissions that get formed and we don't even know about it. They get dissolved and we don't know about it. There are vacancies that come up and get filled and we never hear about it. that happens a lot. But if we are aware, then we will share that with you. You will get invited to a whole bunch of events um, that are fun, power packed. You know, we meet on a regular basis. So you find your own network. You have a bunch of people who are helping you, cheering you on. You get invited to trainings um, and uh, we formally prepare you um, on topics that are related to civic engagement. So you go in there prepared. Um, you get a certificate at the end that says that you have been trained and prepared. So, you know, people know that you know what you're talking about. Um, we help you seek a table, a seat, a seat, seek a seat at the table. We um, help you apply. And we also serve as a resource to elected officials so that if, um, for instance, a commissioner is looking for a divorce pool of candidates, if they contact us, then we are able to say, here are 10 people in my program who are at this point looking for a vacancy and who are willing to um, serve. And um, that is something that we do as well. And um, just recently, um, we have decided to launch a Civic Leadership Academy, the Women's Fund, and this is basically a training series that we are launching on June 3rd. Um, again, this is under the uh, Women's Fund, um, under Appointed. It's part of Appointed, and it's called the Appointed Civil Le Civic Leadership Academy. And that's, again, available to anybody who is in this region. Um, and what it does is it provides formal training, um, for people, uh, for attendees to get prepared for civic engagement. 
Um, it also gives opportunities for um, attendees to um, interface with elected officials. We provide social networking. And at the end, we uh, provide a certificate that says you are uh, prepared. Um, it's free of charge. So we make this accessible to all women from all walks of life so that anybody can um, take advantage of this. Um, and just um, for people who are interested, this is on June 3rd. It's from nine to one and it is at the Greater Cincinnati Foundation. And on your screen, you'll find a, a, a QR code that will take you to how you can register for that event if you're interested. So what is my call to action? Join appointed if you're in this region. And there's a QR code on the side there that tells you how to join. Um, get informed. So if you don't live in the greater Cincinnati region, go to your um, county or city or township website and do what I told you to do, which is to go search for boards and commissions and get connected um, with them. Uh, oh, the one thing I forgot to say was um, I was talking about being patient and applying over and over and calling and asking for a follow-up is also to try and attend a committee meeting if you can and those are open to the public so if you can look on your website on your county's website you will see where when these meetings are being held and feel free to go to a couple of those so you see what what happens in those committee meetings and what the timings are and what kind of decisions get made and you also meet people who are serving there and they get to meet you as well so that when you apply then they know who you are and that helps you thank you so much i was curious just you know, as somebody who might be interested in, in doing being on a board, is there anything and I hope sorry if you I hope I'm not repeating something that you've said. Um, is there, is there a way to like prepare? Do you need a resume? Like what do you need to show or what's a good way to like to prepare yourself? Like say you're very interested in school issues or you maybe you're really interested in your community parks and you want to be on a park board or a library board. Like what's the best way to kind of like pump up a resume or show that you, you know, have experience if there's, if there's a lot of competition for it. Yes. Um, I don't know if this is almost unfair because many people do require a resume. I say it's unfair only because not everybody has a resume, right? If, you know, I, 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 I talk from the perspective of someone who has never worked, um, may not have a resume and this should, should not be a disadvantage, but unfortunately some places it is. So I would say, yes, try to put together something very simple. It doesn't have to be a whole lot. It could even just be a list of things you have done. Most important thing is to show what you bring to the table in terms of like your, your passions, your interests, your skills. So even if you're not looking for like a degree or an educational background, they may be looking for information. Like I have lived in this community for the last 20 years. I have lived in this neighborhood. I have two children who have gone to this school. Um, I have, or I have a child who has um, special needs and I have been in this community and I've lived here and I need some help from this commission, you know, that helps uh, people with disabilities. So giving them some story, a story about yourself is more important, I think, than a resume. Many commissions, at least here in Hamilton County, where I am, um, some commissions will ask for lived experience versus a resume. I have seen that happen quite a bit. Um, we just had some um, vacancies um, come open in the Human Services Advisory Commission, and that was basically, it's human services, right? So people were asking for, the, 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 the county was asking for lived experience. So it helps tremendously to have some sort of a resume, but more importantly, the lived experience is what counts. And what's the typical, I mean, I know everyone is probably completely different, um, but you apply, you know, do most of these boards do an interview process or is it more like they look at the applications or whatever comes through and they make decisions? And I just didn't know if there was kind of a standard procedure. Okay. I figured there, that. there isn't, there isn't. And that again is a systemic issue. Um, there isn't a standardized process. Um, there is there isn't even a process some places like some like I said some vacancies come open and then they're gone even before you can you get to hear about them they're gone and one of the 
common ways in which they get filled is by the elected official or whoever is in charge of filling that could be the chair of the board, could just reach out to someone he knows, right? And that is usually the most common way in which they get filled. Um, just reach out to whoever they play golf with or they meet somewhere in the restaurant or they live across the street from and someone who's given done a favor um, before he wants to pay him back. It could just be that. Just invite somebody who is a buddy and get them on there. And with the, which is one of the reasons why women don't get asked because we are not playing golf and we are not out of the bar and we are not, you know, we are not waving at the guy who lives across the street from us. And so we know when things of us and we also discount our own abilities. We always say, you know, oh, I, I don't think I can do that. I don't know anything about this. What do I know about planning? What do I know about human services? You know, they sound really big and enormous and scary, but they're not really. They're just dealing with day-to-day -day issues in the community. That's all there is. And usually within a week or two, and they'll give you training when you, when you start. Most commissions will give you some sort of informal or formal training. So you can pick this up. I have a neighbor who said he he's a part of the the zoning commission um and i said how did you get on the zoning commission he said um i built a house so i know all about zoning and you know i would never have thought because i built a house too my husband and i but i would never have said i know all about zoning because i built a house but that's what he thinks is needed to get on a zoning commission whereas a woman would say i don't know anything about zoning i'm not even going to apply for that but a guy at the same time, he may know only 1% of what zoning is all about, but he'll immediately say, you know what, I'm going to apply. I think I can do this. So that's the confidence level. That's a difference in the confidence in the way a woman thinks versus a man. Um, that's true for people running for office, too. <laughs> true. true. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. if, you've, if you've never, um, I know a lot of people have maybe never spoken to an elected rep in their community or at their state level. And I highly recommend you do that. <laughs> it will increase your confidence in your ability and, and what you, you you can and cannot do. What Go watch something at your state legislature, just watch a hearing. That's all you're going to have to do. Um, but I, so I do have a question though. So obviously I think a lot of, you know, if I'm a person who wants to get involved in their community, I feel like a lot of people on this call might be like, you know what, I'm, I don't want to run for office yet, or maybe you're a little scared of that whole process, or you don't have the time for it. This is such a great way to kind of get your, like dip your toe in the water of that, or at least make some connections. But it sounds to me like this is a lot of networking. <laughs> so any tips on best ways for women to do that networking in their local communities? Is that best with other women? Is it like figure out who's on these boards that you're interested in and find ways to connect with them? Like, what are your tips in that area? Yeah. So, um, you know, I've only been in this job for about 10 months now. And um, when, when I first did my first appointed training event, um, and we talked about this, um, Julie, this was one of the first questions that someone asked, because a lot of women have not really taken networking seriously. You know what I mean? You go to a party, you say hi to a few people, but they don't think of it as, oh, I need to actually do networking in a scientific way <laughs> in order for me to get ahead. We don't think that way. And so, again, um, you're going to have to think about it in a strategic, scientific way. One of the things that we try to do through appointed, I, I don't want to keep talking about appointed just because I know that people don't live in Ohio and so you don't have access to this, but we try to give women the chance to network. We make it mandatory. So when they come to a training, we actually have like this Civic Leadership Academy, we're built in an hour um, where they are required to network. So it's over lunch and we tell them to go talk to people. Don't sit down, go talk to people, shake their hand, get an elevator speech ready about yourself. What? Who are you? What are you interested in? What are you doing? What is your goal? And then go shake hands and talk to them and tell them a little bit about yourself. Make sure you speak to at least five people before you leave the room. Um, and then before you come in for the next session, make sure you've reached out to two elected officials to try and talk to them. Um, if you're not in this area and you don't have access to appointed, then I would say start going to local networking events. And I mean, um, usually your chamber. Um, your Chamber of Commerce, for instance, might have regular networking events, which you can join. Probably for free. I don't know. Um, I would think about, I would start doing 
searching what are local networking events and how do I get involved? How do I get invited to those? Can I join a newsletter so I get to hear about them? If nothing, form a group with other lady friends that you have and then um, you know, try and start doing that on an, on, a, on, an, on, a, on an ongoing basis. And that way you start making those friends. And it's not just to get appointed, um, that you that you network, you also network so you find um, you can support one another and inspire one another. And you need that when you're going through a process like this, you really need people to kind of vent with. And uh, you need people who can say, you know what, it's okay. I, that happened to me too. But you know what, you're going to go apply again and again. And by the way, I'm going to this event. You want to go with me? Um, that's what this is all about. 100%. And I appreciate that. I was going to ask you, like, what are the best sources, especially for women to look at for, you know, organizations or groups? Because there are Google it, guys. There's probably women networks everywhere that you live. I actually had a friend here who did start a local business network just for women. And it was, you know, all different varieties of, you know, from home businesses to real estate to, you know, lawyers to everything. Um, and it grew, it grew mm -hmm. quickly. You know, mm -hmm. and that's how we feel about organizing. We're always saying, start a group in your community, organize locally, and they will get big quickly. And they do. Um, so I think that's a great idea um, because then you do have that support. And then you can go to maybe that chamber of commerce event. And you're not alone. You have somebody with you and then you can interact, not just with women. You can meet men who are taking, you know, maybe in charge mm -hmm. of a lot of these commissions. So uh, Julie, were there any other questions in the chat? I didn't, I was glancing, but. Well, I think you answered the power board one um, and you talked a little bit about the interview process. Um, someone said uh, is revealing your passions when opposition to the existing board. That seems like a guaranteed rejection. <laughs> um, you'll have to try and reveal your passions without sounding like you're in opposition to the board. You know, um, I, the, the board may be, I mean, they have to be open to that. I mean, I, I just don't know how they can not take you just because you are a Democrat with a Republican board, um, you know, and boards should not be totally, they are, many of them are, I, I, I must admit, many of them are Republican or Democrat, depending on the administration, but um, of that county or township. But I would say for the most part, you know, they shouldn't even bother about whether you're Republican or Democrat. You know, that is technically they shouldn't, right? They shouldn't in theory, but they do. Some places they ask you right off the bat, are you Republican or Democrat? They look you up to see if you're registered Democrat, Republican before they'll take you. Those boards, I, I don't know what to say to, this, say to you because there is no easy way to skim that gap. But I would say for the most part, you shouldn't have to hide who you are in order to get to be on a border commission. Um, if you have to, then you have to. I don't, I, I, I just don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I would, it would, <laughs> I mean, right. politics and everything, whether we like yes. it or not. <laughs> yes. um, so, but I definitely would say, you know, I would start at that one board. And if that's not going to happen, then maybe you find something else or go to a different direction and, then you start making those community connections and then suddenly, oh, you know, you've met somebody who knows somebody on that board or you've kind of increased your, your mm -hmm. uh, power in your community or your, you know, your connections there. So mm -hmm. there's, there's always a play. You just yeah. talk to your friends about it. Um, right. Sorry, Julie, back to you. Was there? Yeah. Um, somebody else asked if they, well, they were asking about the non-discrimination laws. Do those apply in these appointments? No. Nobody is watching. Nobody is looking. That's the problem. You know, this is this is an issue, just like the diversity issue was an issue many years ago, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, many years ago, nobody thought about diversity. They just they just appointed people, um, recruited people for jobs. Didn't think of diversity at all as an issue. This is this is sort of like that. It's the beginning of a movement. I don't know whether at some point this will become a issue where they will be able to hold people accountable for discrimination. Um, at this point, no. At this point, there is absolutely no formalized process that exists anywhere. Um, so this is very 
haphazard. This is very, you know, it's done in some places, it's open to a certain extent, some places it's not open at all. It's a closed book. And I have had instances where I have called and said, you know, what is your process or do you have any vacancies? And they won't tell me. They'll immediately say there are no vacancies. I think because they think I'm going to apply because I'm a woman and they are like, you have any vacancies? And they'll say, no, there are no vacancies. And then I'll say, do you know? And then I have to explain myself and say, look, I'm not trying to apply. I'm calling because I want to know so that I can send it out to my network because I'm in this organization and I'd like to. Um, and then I explain myself. And then finally I say, can you, can you connect me with someone like a, your, your county administrator? And then I'll get like three openings. That's it. You know, when in reality, there may be many more. We'll never know. Yeah. Okay. Were there any more questions in the chat? Nope. That was it. No, I saw some good advice in there. So mm -hmm. excellent presentation. People saying thank you. Um, yeah, definitely checking the community calendars, uh, you know, each and every way. Um, so I encourage everybody to go get involved. Um, I will say I was on a school committee, which I found fascinating. You learned a lot of things behind the scenes. I met, you know, people in the school administration. I found it really enjoyable. So highly recommend doing this work. Um, and it's a great way as a, as a stepping stone to maybe even running for office, which we're always encouraging. So yeah. thank you so much. Put, oh. I put my email down there so that if people want to talk to me or email, email me, that's fine. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us tonight and hope to see you um, Thursday with Jess for comms 101 and definitely um, check out our ask me anything events I think they're going to be really, really outstanding, and I hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.